This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand. From MPB Think Radio, this is Mississippi Education Connection. I'm your host, Michelle McAdoo, along with my co-host, Tara Wren, Director of Education here at MPB. Well, as the pandemic continues, it forces new problems on struggling families and has put children's futures at an even higher risk. Today, we'll take a look at those issues and more with our guest, Linda Southward, Executive Director of the Children's Foundation of Mississippi. Plus, we love to hear from you. Tell us how you and your family are adapting to this new normal. Now, the number to call is 1-877-672-7464. Well, good morning, Tara. Good morning, Michelle. How are you today? I am happy. It's Friday, another week gone by. Absolutely. (laughs) Schools are about to, well, Clinton started, they did uh, different last names. So some names started yesterday, and then the other group started today. Okay. Um, I I think Rankin County, they're all starting um, next week or Monday. And then I believe Madison is still going to go ahead and push theirs. They're going to stick with that and opening up in September. September. Yes. Hines County is opening Monday. Monday. As well. Wow. A lot across the state are just staggered how they are opening. They are. And uh, again, we have a lot of issues around that. A lot of parents have um, um, just a lot of different situations in different households. And, uh, that's what we want to talk about today. We want to talk about how COVID-19 has affected families in a way. Yes. Uh, it could be food disparities. It could be um, d- child care help. It could mm-hmm. be um, Internet. Just that welfare mm-hmm. of the family. And yes, yes. Things that we put on hold and that we have forgotten about everything else that's happening because life still is going on, going on outside of COVID-19. And that's what we're going to talk about, a very important conversation to provide some reminders and, hey, things that we need to think about and continue to do as we progress in our families, you know, True. even though COVID is still a thing, the most important thing that we have to think about our safety as well. We there. do. We do. So what's happening in the education department? I know you guys have been really busy. Yeah. So we stay busy. The, the one thing that's coming up next Wednesday, Workforce Wednesday, it's a part of our workforce development initiative. And we have these every third Wednesday of the month. When COVID hit, we um, have not done it for several months, but we are going to start back up on Wednesday at 1130 with Pam Confer. Okay. Pam's going to come in and talk about soft skills. She has a workshop on soft skills. And, you know, we're we're in the pandemic, but we still have to work and folks are still looking for work. And she's going to talk to us in a fun way. She's always fun to talk to, have a workshop there, talk about how those skills that we need to get a job and to stay on our job. So, to keep the job. <laughs> to keep the job. Absolutely. Because that's just as important. It is. So people can go to our education.mpbonline.org to register for that. We do. Um, we're going to do it on our virtual platform. Okay, so, so we'll be very, oh, that was absolutely. my next question. So <laughs> how many, uh, so being in, being on a virtual platform, you can actually have more than normal if you were doing it in the building, correct? Yes, it's typically in the building and a, good, a little intimate group, about 50 folks, you know, at the most we try to, it's usually a lunch and we provide lunch and a prize and we'll still provide the prize, okay. but not the lunch not this the time. Lunch. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we're, we're excited about starting that back up. The other thing, we're, we're working on some resources that we are planning to roll out here shortly. I'm sure we'll be talking about it in a, yes. in a few weeks here for um, to support the school year on our website. So a lot of things going on there in education. Keep up with us at education, uh, MPB Education on our social media platforms and, of course, on the website. All right. And uh, to piggyback off what we talked about last week, I think, or two weeks ago, mm-hmm. uh, vi- virtual hosting, virtual learning hosting sites. If you know of any virtual learning hosting sites in your area, in your community, you can email or go to the website. You can go to to email it to us at education at mpbonline.org. We want to push those out and let folks know in your community who's helping and who's extending this arm to, you know, provide these services while parents are at school. If you have a homeschool situation and, you know, there what those websites or social media sites that we talked about last week where folks can go and get lots of information on homeschooling because that's a 
a big, big thing, thing now. Too. It so is, it is. Let us know what you're doing. Education at mpbonline.org. Send us an email, and we will push that information out for everyone and just trying to help be that village. Yes, and you never know um, what you provide the um, our department can help someone else because they are looking. And um, if you can provide any information on that, that will be very helpful. Now, we'll be talking with um, our guest in just a bit, a little bit, Linda Southward. She is the executive director of the Children's Foundation of Mississippi. But before we um, go to her and take our first break, I want to talk about distance learning. I know a lot of parents and students uh, either were were forced into distance learning in March, and it was new for a lot of uh, families. But now we're back on the distance learning track, and it presents tough challenges. And we're all learning how to do things differently for a while, even just at least, hopefully, Mm -hmm. for this semester. Mm -hmm. Now, even very digitally savvy young people may struggle with educational technology because they're on Instagram and Facebook and YouTube and what TikTok and all those other platforms. Mm -hmm. But educational technology is a little bit different. So I have a few tips for distance learning um, for families and parents. Number one, establish routines and expectations. Number two, choose a good place to learn. Very important. I just bought my daughter her desk, Mm -hmm. and I set up her classroom at home, and I'm so proud. I need to take a picture of it, maybe post it, but I try not to do a lot of posting, but it is really nice. She's going to get up in the morning. She's in 11th grade, so Mm -hmm. she's going to get up and go to school, which is right across in her room, but we want the children to understand that they are going to real school. It's just digital. And the routine is good. It's good to create that space for routine It is purposes. It is. Uh, number three, stay in touch. This is for parents. If you have a question, if you don't understand something, if something is uh, not working, pick up the phone, email, get those emails from your uh, principals, your counselors, school counselors, and even the technical department, if they have one. I don't know if Jackson Public Schools will uh, want you to contact their technical department per se, but contact your school first and see what they say. But if you're you're having any issues, don't sit back and wait till it's a problem, till your child looks like, if it looks like she hasn't or he hasn't been um, logging on, I know they're going to be really strict about the time, so they're going to be tardy after a certain time, and then those tardies will turn into absences, and you do not want to go into that. And then at that time, say, we were having technical difficulty. If you're having any technical difficulty, go ahead and speak up. Also, if you're having any issues with the work and you have questions, contact your teachers, uh, their your students' teachers early. Also, help students own their learning. Now, this was for me, and I know a lot of parents <laughs> uh, probably are in my shoes. I have to read this. No one expects parents to be full-time teachers or to be educational and content matter experts. Provide support and encouragement and expect your children to do their part. Struggling is allowed and encouraged. Mm. Don't help too much. I highlighted that last line for me. For yourself. As a parent, I know parents are listening right now. It's so challenging to sit back and watch your child struggle a little bit and you want to step in and help them. But we need to help, especially our older students, and start with the younger ones too. Let them own their own learning. And this is really teaching. One of my friends works for MDE, and she said, in a silver lining, tear, I'm sure you can uh, attest to this, this is pushing our students to another level of responsibility, Absolutely. getting them ready for almost college level uh, responsibility, taking ownership of their own, their work. Creates more accountability. Accountability. Yes. And parents, we, we have to let them do that. Yes. Oh, wow. Uh, establish times for quiet and reflection. I like that, too. So I know they have a lot of work. They have a full schedule. But they need to relax and they need to have some quiet time to reflect on the work. We don't want to push them so hard to where they get, they get frustrated. Encourage physical activity and exercise. This is important. They're going to be in the house doing a lot of work, having to be. Someone told me today that their student, their child has to be online for five hours a mm-hmm. day. So they do have PE and recess at regular mm-hmm. school. So let them get out and get some fresh air and then come back and mm-hmm. recharge and get back online. They're going to need it. They're going to need mm-hmm. it. Manage stress and make the most of an unusual situation. Of course, we all will be uh, stressed out. And Tara, this is what I thought about. I'm lucky. 
I have one. Imagine a family, which I'm sure we'll get calls later on, of families with different age groups, different mm-hmm. high school, middle school, elementary. Mm-hmm. That's a lot in one household. Mm-hmm. So it's going to be high stress, <laughs> but you got to learn how to maintain it. Monitor time on screen and online. So if they're going to be doing digital learning, make sure after they finish school that they they disconnect. Uh, go outside, watch some television, do something else besides get back online, uh, TikTok or YouTube or <laughs> Instagram. Let them disconnect from the uh, social media world for a while. And connect safely with friends and be kind. Mm-hmm. I must say this, and I have to say this. I did an orientation with, I'm not going to say what district, but the orientation that uh, I was included in, students from the school and parents were chatting in the chat box and the language that was used, uh, phones weren't muted. You heard vulgar language. You heard vulgar music. We need to understand that there's etiquette and protocol and things that you have not been um, used to doing. Mm -hmm. Zoom meetings, Zoom Mm -hmm. uh, classrooms, students, parents. I need you to teach your students how to have etiquette in the Zoom classrooms. Uh, mute your mics if you're not asking a question. Let the teacher talk. Uh, please mute your mics because whatever's going on in your home mm-hmm. can be heard and the st- other students can't hear the teacher. But that's another opportunity, Michelle, for people to create that space where they're going to have those Zoom meetings, where class is going to take place because that creates in that atmosphere of this is school, this is a place where I talk like this or I look like this, or I engage in this manner. So that is a, another opportunity where you talked about creating a space for the student to learn. Des- determine where you're going to have your meetings. And that's for parents and those of us who are working mm-hmm. from home sometime as well. You know, create that space. Make the background, you know, they have all the Zoom uh, rules or mm-hmm. etiquette. Mm-hmm. Um, best practices, you know, nothing moving, not, no sound. You know, and buy a headset if you can. That makes the noise reduction and it all sounds that like an everyday tech show idea <laughs> jay white are you listening everyday tech i know we're yes. gonna talk about it's zoom or uh, etiquette for students online distance learning i mean that's a whole show we can yes. we might do that on this show actually <laughs> well it's time for us to take a quick break but before i go if you didn't catch any of those tips we're going to post those on our podcast and i'll put them more in depth so you can get tips for how to digitally digitally uh teach your students online um, when we get back we'll speak with our guest linda southward executive director of Ch- the children's foundation of mississippi now remember we want to hear how the pandemic has affected you and your family if you have a question or comment for the show you can join the conversation by calling 1-877-672-7464. Stay tuned. This is Mississippi Education Connection on MPB Think Radio. Dr. Susan Buttress, Professor of Pediatrics at the University of Mississippi Medical Center and host of Southern Remedies Relatively Speaking. Join us as we explore issues that relate to you and your family, from mental health obstacles and family interactions to handling life disruptions. Whatever the issue, let's try to figure it out together. You can listen live Tuesdays at 11 on MPB Think Radio, or you can subscribe to the podcast by searching for Southern Remedy on your preferred podcasting app. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. Good morning, and thanks for listening to MPB Think Radio. Inside Mississippi Education Connection. I'm your host, Michelle McAdoo, along with my co-host, Tara Wren, Director of Education here at MPB. Well, today we're taking a look 
at the impact of COVID-19 on children and families. Now, if you have a question or comment for the show, we'd love to hear from you. The number to call is one eight seven seven mpb ring That's one 672 Now, let's welcome our first guest to the show, Executive Director of the Children's Foundation of Mississippi, Linda Southward. Good morning, Linda. Good morning. How are you? Doing fine here. How are you? Good, good. Thanks for having me. Oh, thanks for um, taking a little time out of your busy schedule, I'm sure, to spend here with us at Mississippi Education Connection. Before we get started talking about, of course, the foundation and uh, what the goals and missions are, um, are for the foundation. Tell us a little bit about you and how you began with this organization. Well, I began last August, uh, and that's when the uh, Children's Foundation was started. But it had been in the planning for a number of years, um, and we had initial support from the W.K. Kellogg Foundation and the Annie E. Casey Foundation. Before that, I was uh, employed for many years at the Social Science Research Center at Mississippi State University. All right. So what is your role with the Children's Foundation of Mississippi? I am the executive director. Okay. And uh, so let's talk about the foundation. Tell us a little bit of the history of the uh, foundation and how the organization began and why. Well, we began, uh, it's been over a period of several years that the planning has gone into creating the Children's Foundation. Mississippi, um, there were many people around the state who felt like that there was a void in, having, in not having an organization that really brings people together um, and really uh, works collaborative across systems. So we were founded as an independent operating foundation in August. Uh, in fact, this is our one-year anniversary, and our mission is to design, promote, and improve policies and systems that improve the well-being of children in our state. And we really believe, as, as have the funders, that for Mississippi to reach its potential, we must make sure that our state's children reach theirs. And when we make sure that children get off to a strong start, we're really setting the stage for our communities to realize new possibilities. Okay, so you talked about um, the goal of the um, organization. Let's let's break that down a little bit. What types of goals uh, do you plan to accomplish? Let's start with shape systems. How do you plan to shape systems, and what systems are you trying to shape? Well, we're looking at systems across. When you think about a child and you think about a child holistically, there are many um, systems. Clearly, when we when we look at a child within the context of a family, within the context of a community, um, I just heard a little of the sh- obviously your shows about education. So the education system is one that impacts children. We look at um, various uh, systems that are out there. Some children have interaction interaction with um, child protective services. We also know that um, health and well-being are are important parts of children uh, children's development. So, for example, when we think about policy and systems change, let's think about we know in Mississippi only about three in ten of young children, very young children, receive developmental screening, and we also know that around nine percent of Mississippi's four-year-olds are served in public pre-K. Um, so there, and, and we know that each of those really have, um, really can possibly impact children. So, for example, if a child does not receive a developmental screen and the ch- early on and then the child shows up in kindergarten or first grade, when things that could have been um, worked on with the parent and with the child early on uh, could be ameliorated, then their their projection their trajectory for positive outcomes is going to be increased. So that's an example of systems change. And then fostering collaboration is really bringing together groups of people who might be working on similar areas, mm-hmm. but 
may not know about each other's work, and the last thing we want to do is to duplicate work, but determine new ways to work together and bring the strengths of each entity to the table. Oh, so that's that's good. I love the um, fostering collaboration. So tell me what type of things, big things that you guys are, are planning. Well, the our we're going to focus on a small number of signature projects. And so one that we're in the midst of right now that we believe can be very significant to improve outcomes for Mississippi's children is to develop a blueprint on behalf of Mississippi's children. To our knowledge, it's the first ever of its kind of a blueprint. And we're looking at this blueprint in two um, areas. We're looking at at it for children zero through eight and for children and youth nine through 18 years of age because we know those first eight years really do set the stage for positive outcomes um, nine through 18 years of age. No. So we have, uh, we have some graduate students, I'm sorry, who are working with us this summer and they're interviewing many leaders across the state and statewide uh, needs assessment has been released this week and will continue on through September collecting data, looking at various reports and be very thoughtful uh, in the blueprint that comes out and to have many voices um, input into it as possible. Okay, Linda, can you talk about the, the data that you guys collect, you, you do or are involved in um, presenting the survey data to the um, state and to, can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, earlier this year in uh, February, it seems so long ago now, but in February, uh, the Children's Foundation released its first uh, survey of Mississippi issues impacting children. And we really want to use data as a guide to inform good policy. And this is a random survey um, funded by the Kellogg Foundation, conducted by the Social Science Research Center at Mississippi State. And we found from that survey that 83% of Mississippians support a public state-funded pre-kindergarten system. Um, there was also near unanimous support for child care uh, uh, quality ratings of the 95%, and then 94% of Mississippians value policies to make sure that children get off to a good start. And among the Mississippians surveyed, this 94% uh, expressed support for requiring a wellness exam or checkup before enrolling children um, in child care centers. Now, so with, that's, I'm sorry, <laughs> with that information that you received, the key findings from your survey, from that particular survey, what do you do with that information? How does that information change policy? Well, it informs policy and decision makers because I do think that people want to listen to their constituents. They want to know and hear the voices of areas that matter to Mississippians. And it's very clear that um, there are many areas on the, on, to increase the opportunities around developing uh, positive development of children that are near and dear to the hearts of Mississippians. And we, so in regard to delivering data, Mississippi uh, Kids Count is a, is a part of the Children's Foundation as of uh, January of 2020. And uh, a shout out to Heather Hanna and Ben Walker and uh, Lori Bell and others at the Social Science Research Center where Mississippi uh, Kids Count had its previous home since 2007. But the entire 2020 Kids Count Factbook is devoted to the census. And we just know how important this is for many reasons in Mississippi for, for everyone to be counted and certainly for the over 700,000 children, zero to 18, that live in Mississippi. So can you talk a little bit more for about Kids Count for our listeners who haven't heard of it or understand it, it to that point, what exactly are the implications for from the Kids Count um, sur survey information? Oh, yeah, so Kids Count, if I can just back up, it's, it's supported by the Annie E. Casey Foundation. And Annie 
E. Casey was the mother of Jim Casey, who founded United Parcel Service. And so each state, uh, plus the District of Columbia, Puerto Rico, and Virgin Islands, have a kids count grantee. And by and large, they're uh, almost all within nonprofit organizations. At one time, they were located more within universities. But kids count grantees in each of these 53 uh, entities um, are not only viewed as the premier source of data and information about children in each of their respective states or territories, but also seen as a place where solid evidence-based recommendations are made uh, to promote sound policies on behalf of children and their families. And the Any Casey Foundation has been uh, collecting this data and having a state-by-state analysis uh, for more than 30 years now, and they're released each summer. Each summer. Huh? As far, go ahead. Oh, no, I was going to say we're going to take a quick break, and I love this information you're giving us. We're going to come back and uh, continue talking with you, Linda, about um, your kids, Mississippi's Kids Count, and we're going to talk about some other um, projects you guys have coming up as well. If you have a question for Linda South- Southward, uh, you can give us a call at 1-877-672-7464. Plus, if you want to let us know how the pandemic has affected you and your family, give us a call as well. Stay tuned. This is Mississippi Education Connection on MPB Think Radio. if you use an app to start your car or still have a flip phone. Everyday Tech can decipher today's technology for tomorrow's solutions. Subscribe now to the podcast using any podcast app or the MPB public media app. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. Welcome back. This is Mississippi Education Connection on MPB Think Radio. I'm your host, Michelle McAdoo, along with my co-host, Tara Wren, Director of Education here at MPB. Well, today we've been discussing the impact of COVID-19 on children and families with our guest, Linda Southward, Executive Director of the Children's Foundation of Mississippi. Now, if you have a question or comment for the show, give us a call at 1-877-672-7464. Now, Linda... Um, Before the break, we were talking about the different the key findings of your different surveys. Now, this last survey we were talking about was the 2020 household poll survey, uh, the food insecurity survey, correct? Yes, that survey was actually done by a number of federal um, agencies, including the U.S. Census Bureau. Okay, And what were some of the key findings from that survey about food insecurities in Mississippi? Yes, specifically for food insecurity, um, they defined it as food uh, scarcity, but really food insecurity is often described as not having enough food and not being able to access healthy food for all members of a household. Um, so in early April, this, this has been going on for 12 weeks or so, um, and one of the first findings for Mississippi in early April of households um, indicated that there was food scarcity with a high of 21%, so one out of five households. But the latest survey finding is ticking down a little, is approximately 19%. So, Linda, can you tell us the implications of that um, in Mississippi and with education? Because we know if children are hungry and they're not really learning at at capacity. Can you talk a little bit about the implications of that finding? You're absolutely right. So for children and adolescents, um, I believe their bodies and minds, as we know, are still developing. They're still under construction, if you will. So missing meals can have a long-term effect on health and learning. And um, But even prior to the pandemic, 23% of Mississippi's children lived in food-insecure households. 
So the implications for this prior to the pandemic and certainly now among households is something that um, is, is, as we were talking earlier about some systems and policy change, some ways that that the state could really uh, determine ways to help more families. And there are many private organizations out there across the state who are doing a terrific job with the Mississippi Food Network, Extra Table. We saw communities, I think, of Starfall and others all across the state as the schools were shuttering in March. Uh, really stepping up to the plate, literally the plate, and saying, you know, we can still provide meals for our school-aged children. So it's extremely important finding. Right. So we're, and I heard that list that you just put in. We will put that list, Michelle, I'm sure, on uh, um, the podcast. But where can we find or um, folks get in touch with some of these organizations? Are they listed somewhere, Linda? Oh, yes. I will give a shout out to the Mississippi Alliance of Nonprofits and Philanthropy. There are volunteer hubs throughout um, the the network there. The United Ways uh, uh, organizations across Mississippi are another area. Uh, the Children's Foundation website is increasingly adding to uh, resources uh, where people can also reach out. Okay. All right. So let's switch gears a little bit and talk about your chat about children series and your partnership with the Mississippi Alliance of Nonprofits and Philanthropy. Oh, we're really excited about that. Um, Very excited about. So now more than ever, there are many questions we know about school reopening and the safety of children and all who are involved within the school system, as you were speaking about earlier on the show. So we came up with the idea uh, that having a chat uh, about children would be something that we could uh, put out to a large audience using social media. Uh, as many of us are not having in-person conferences and not having in-person meetings, et cetera. So we just thought, okay, uh, let's have a chat and let's chat about children. So our first chat took place uh, this week. It will the premiere of that will be dropped on our uh, kids count on our Children's Foundation Facebook at 12 noon today. But the first two. Um, uh, folks we chatted with were Dr. Carla J. Revers, uh, Evers, superintendent of the past Christian School District, and Dr. Kerry Wright, the state superintendent of, of education. Um, and so the Children's Foundation asked what would be questions that if parents or anyone in the community, given the opportunity, would like to pose to these educational leaders. So we had a great response. And then there were many questions asked about uh, anything from the greatest challenges to reopening to state testing requirements to um, personal protective equipment, and then also how ways that teachers are being supported and how you can support parents. And central to all of this is really dealing with the stress and uncertainties that children are facing. That's so wonderful. we just want to hear this. And it was a great response, and, and we have other chats in the work. Uh, we are planning on new chats on the topics of children's health, uh, child care, uh, and its impact upon businesses in the communities, children or youth in foster care, and really a chat about a wide variety of topics impacting children. And, and if I could take this opportunity, if anyone who's listening has a suggestion for a topic or a chat, if you would send your request to chat at childrensfoundationms.org or just info at childrensfoundationms.org, uh, we would love to hear from you. We would love to get various ideas from all across the state. Um, uh, what people want to chat about, what they're interested in. All right. Well, that again, that will be posted today at 12 noon on your Facebook page, that conversation with Dr. Carrie Wright and past Christian Public School Superintendent, Dr. Carla 
Evers. Now, how can people help your organizations, both actually Mississippi Kids Count and the Mississippi uh, Children's Foundation? Well, Mississippi Kids County, as we said, is now part of the Children's Foundation. Okay. Send us, a, send us ideas, uh, share information that you're seeing on social media, on Facebook, um, about the work that we're doing. Uh, when you, uh, there may be some who will receive a uh, needs assessment about the blueprint. We would love for people to answer that, to be able to have um, information. Um, and certainly there's a donate bu- button on the uh, Children's Foundation website as well. But we really want to be able to have meaningful work that is going to, as we said before, really promote systems and policy change because it's important to help one child or two children or a small number, but if we can look at ways, for example, to increase pre-K funding for children across the state, that's going to help 40,000 four-year-olds each year going forward because that's about the number of four-year-olds we have um, in Mississippi. So we're looking at broad things. We're looking at people at, at pulling people together as well. All right. And that website is www.childrensfoundationms.org. And I will post that on our podcast um, for people to get more information about your organization. Thank you so much, Ms. Linda, for spending a little time with us here at Mississippi Education Connection. And you're welcome back anytime. <laughs> Oh, we appreciate it so much. There's also been another study that we'll talk about another time um, that was commissioned by the U.S. Chamber of Commerce Foundation and the Mississippi Economic Council. So thank you. I appreciate um, the opportunity to talk about the Children's Foundation and hear uh, all the great things that are going on within your program as well. Thank you so much. Well, it's time for us to take our final break, and when we return, we'll talk with our listeners about how COVID-19 has affected their families. If you have a question or comment for the show, give us a call at 1-877-MPB-RING. That's 1-877-672-7464. Stay tuned. This is Mississippi Education Connection on MPB Think Radio. Hey, this is Malcolm White. I'm one of the hosts of the Mississippi Arts Hour, the arts interview show on Think Radio. Every week we talk with visual artists, musicians, as well as people who help bring the arts to their communities. We hear about how each artist learned their craft and get some insight into their creative process. You can hear the Arts Hour every Sunday at 5 p.m. or listen anytime by subscribing to the show through your favorite podcast app. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. You're listening to Mississippi Education Connection on MPB Think Radio. To call the show, dial 1 877 MPB Ring. That's 1 877 672 7464. You're listening to MPB Think Radio. This is MPB Think Radio, and you're listening to Mississippi Education Connection. I'm your host, Michelle McAdoo, along with my co-host, Tara Wren, Director of Education here at MPB. Well, if you're just joining us and tuning in but didn't get a chance to listen to the whole show, you can listen to the entire show on on our podcast by searching mpbonline.org slash Mississippi Education Connection on our MPB public media app or on your favorite podcast app. Now, today we've been discussing the effects of COVID-19 on children and families. Now, earlier we spoke with Alinda Southward, Executive Director of the Children's Foundation of Mississippi. Now, let's hear from a few parents around the state. Uh, Our first caller, looks like, is Pam. Pam from Byram. Good morning, Pam. Good morning. Hi, thanks for calling in. 
thanks for taking my call. You're welcome. You're welcome. So we've been talking about COVID-19. Uh, we started the show in March, at the end of March, when COVID-19 first hit. And we know that there have been layers and levels of uh, challenges within families. Talk about a little bit about um, how your family has fared within this pandemic. Well, uh, I'd, I'd like to acknowledge that we got a little taste of this um, last spring towards the end of the school year. Um, we got a chance to kind of see how things were going to work with this. It was all new to everyone. And I think now the expectation is, okay, you understand how things work and, um, you know, things are going to be kind of, the standards are going to be raised a little bit now as far as expectations from children and families. Um, but last spring, um, you know, most of the things that the kids learned in school, the first three semesters was already uh, within them. It was established. It was taught. Um, the parents really didn't have to introduce any new information but more so uh, monitor the children as they recalled information that was already taught to them. And uh, they were able to work more independently. And, um, you know, so I think that there's a little anxiety about that going forward is that we're introducing or going to be responsible for introducing totally new concepts, not as educators, but as parents trying to do the best that we can. Um, and so we're just uh, taking it and, and trying to, move forward as best as we can. So, Pam, um, Pam, you have children, you have different um, age group, age levels in your home, so they're in different grades, and so how are you adapting adapting to that? And what are the grades at first? Let's talk about the ages and the grades levels. Well, we'll, we'll have three school ages um, this fall, um, and so they're, they're 10, 9, and 5, so they'll be 4th and 5th grade, and then there's a kindergartner. So um, that's that's going to be a challenge in itself. Our major concern was for our kindergarten, and I haven't been in uh, public school at all and was looking forward to the whole, you know, big school experience <laughs> and what, whatever that looked like in her little mind and what we ha- we thought that that would look like, especially having two children who haven't gone through that already. But um, just trying to adapt to this new normal and uh, make the experience as best can for her. Well, Pam, tell us, how are you doing that? So you're talking about adapting and you're talking about uh, expectations from uh, for students. And Well, I think that um, it, it's important to acknowledge that um, there's different options, you know, based on different school districts. You know, you have the people going back 100% virtual, then there's 100% traditional, and then those hybrid options, and then some people are totally homeschooling their, ch- their children on their own. And what we had to decide for our family, considering several factors, is that the going back 100% traditional is what's going to be best for us because we have such a large family and both of our, us parents are uh, working full-time. Um, my husband, a couple of days a week from home, but then there's days he has to go in the office. And next month he's been informed he's back at the office full-time. And then myself working Um, from home, but then on occasion having to go in for meetings and then um, having to make visits with patients and things. So the virtual option wasn't going to work for us, and our children were going back traditional, which was a hard decision to make. And so um, it was an emotional decision to make, and we just had to um, really do our research, and we found comfort in some of the extra precautions and measures that are being taken by the school. But um, in, in response to your question, to help Melanie um, adjust, that's our kindergartner, to what she can expect, um, we did take her to the school, and, you know, temps were taken, the screener questions were asked. Um, she got a chance to meet her teacher. She got a chance to see her classroom, her seat, her cubby hole. So those things will be the same. But as far as how the day will go, um, you know, those things will be different. But... The benefit of that is she doesn't have anything to compare that right. to. So basically what she goes into now will be her normal. Um, I think that the most normal thing for her is being able to go. And so we, we do have lots of fears and concerns, but at the same time, um, you know, finding some comfort in those precautions and extra safety measures that they're um, providing at the school. And then we're making changes as well, like instead of using 
the school transportation, we're doing um, drop off and pick up ourselves. So, you know, it's it's hard, but we're doing the best that we can right. with our circumstances. Right. You made some great points. Last thing, what advice would you give other parents, especially since you guys decided to do face-to-face traditional schooling, what advice would you give other parents who made that tough decision, they really didn't have a choice, and they have to put their children back in school face-to-face? Um, I would say just really engage your support system, whether that's your family, extended family, um, and even just other parents in your community. Um, and, you know, I've heard that the YMCA um, there's a school, Judah School of Performing Arts, and even some parents, they have been opening their doors to other parents who have to work. There's, you know, not everyone is able to work from home, so their kids have to go back to school um, traditionally. So I say just engage your support systems. Um, I know a lot of us, we're used to just handling our business on our own, but in times like these, we really need each other. And so we're even having to rely on the grandparents to help us with those pickups and drop-offs because, you know, like I said, we're working and our days aren't going to be um, like they used to be. So that's the biggest thing I'd say. Um, we just need each other. We just got to depend on each other and help each other out as best we can. All right. Well, thank you, Pam. Thank you for those words of wisdom and advice for other parents who are sending their children back to school this fall. Um Be safe, be careful, and I hope they have a great school year. Well, we're going to go to our next caller from Gaucher, Mississippi, Yolanda. Good morning, Yolanda. Good morning. Hi, good morning. How you doing? Thanks for uh, calling the show today. Uh, I don't know if you were listening to um, our other caller. We were asking her questions about how her family adapted within the pandemic. How has the pandemic affected your family dynamic? Well, as the previous caller stated, you know, we started back in March um, with our kids coming home. I only have, I have a 17-year-old, and she's a, she was a junior at the time. And so now she is a senior, and it was not a difficult transition for her because she's a little older. And so all of her classes were online, but we did look at the options for her going back to school and, and I chose the traditional because she is part of an extracurricular activity. And if you're part of any type of sporting activity or anything like that, you know, being at home and doing virtual learning was not an option. Right. You actually had to be on the campus in order to participate in those things. And so because she's very active in school, that was the option that we chose. The The precaution measures have been great. Um, at the school, she actually started going to the school probably a month prior to school actually starting oh. because of the activity that she's in. And so um, masks are mandated. There were sanitation stations even before you walk into the courtyard of the school. The teachers have a mask. There was a the school actually revamped everything as far as the desk and even the cafeteria for the students in order for them to eat lunch. And so I feel very comfortable with how our district has decided to do the traditional learning, and so far, so good. Talk about a few of the challenges, if you've had any, and what advice would you give other parents dealing with this situation? Okay, personally, I, we haven't had any challenges because, like I said, she is older, and so she understands exactly what is going on. Um, emotionally with her, there were some things that changed mm-hmm. with the organization that she's active in. All right. Well, that was Yolanda from Gaucher, Mississippi. Tara, you want to comment on some of the things she said? It's interesting that the caller from Byron, Mississippi, her dynamic was different. So they had to choose that option to send them back to school. And you heard she said it wasn't easy. It was an emotional decision. Yeah, well, I'm sure that's the case for a lot of parents. They have to, uh, they're forced to, into a decision that they probably would not would would not have made, but under the circumstances, you know, they they're doing what they have to do. And you know, one thing that I um, am interested in, you know, what are their plan Bs? Because you know, a lot of schools are opening, and some children have to go home. And just want to say that, hey, if you don't have a plan B in mind, you have to start thinking about a plan B. So, and I, did you hear what um, Pam said? You have to now reach out in your community, reach right. out to your family members, and. Right. 
ask for that help. Absolutely. Well, we had a great show today. Thank you for listening, and we want to thank our callers, and of course, thank our guest, Linda Southward, Executive Director of the Children's Foundation of Mississippi, for joining us today. Now, this program is a production of MPB Think Radio in conjunction with MPB's Education Department and the Mississippi Department of Education. For Tara Wren, I'm Michelle McAdoo. Stay tuned for Southern Remedy for Women and join us next Friday right here at 10 a.m. on MPB Think Radio.